Huckleberry Finn first made his appearance in the book called The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, written by Mark Twain and published in 1876. Tom was a young, imaginative and mischievous boy who lived on the banks of the Mississippi River about 140 years ago and had many adventures with his great friend Huckleberry Finn, wild, uncared for, the son of the town drunk. At the end of that book, the two boys discover a hoard of stolen money and find themselves suddenly rich. This book, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, begins with an attempt to civilise Huck. He's adopted by the widow Douglas, made to wash and wear clean clothes and go to school. And Huck hates it all so much that he's not really sorry when his drunken and brutal father kidnaps him, holds him prisoner in a cabin by the river and tries to get his fortune for himself. Pap kept me with him all the time, and I never got a chance to run off. We lived in that old cabin, and he always locked the door and put the key under his head knots. He had a gun, which he'd stole, I reckon, and we fished and hunted, and that's what we lived on. Every little while, he locked me in and went down to the store three miles to the ferry and traded fish and game for whiskey and fetched it home and got drunk and had a good time and licked me. The widow, she found out where I was by and by, and she sent a man over to try to get hold of me, but Pat drove him off with a gun. Now, it weren't long after that till I was used to being where I was and liked it. All but the cowhide part. He was kind of lazy and jolly, laying off comfortable all day, smoking and fishing, and no books or study. But by and by, Pap got too handy with his hickory and I couldn't stand it. I was all over welts. He got to going away so much, too, and locking me in. Once he locked me in and was gone three days. It was dreadful lonesome. I judged he got drowned, and I wasn't ever going to get out anymore. I was scared. I made up my mind I'd fix up some way to leave there. I tried to get out of that cabin many a time, but I couldn't find no way. There weren't a window to it big enough for a dog to get through. I couldn't get up the chimney. It was too narrow. And the door was thick, solid oak slabs. Pap was pretty careful not to leave a knife or anything in the cabin when he was away. I reckon I hunted that place over as much as a hundred times. Well, I was most all the time at it because it was about the only way to put in the time. But this time, I found something at last. I found an old, rusty wood saw without any handle. It was laid in between the rafter and the clapboards of the roof. I greased it up and went to work. There was an old horse blanket nailed against the logs at the far end of the cabin behind the table to keep the wind from blowing through the chinks and putting the candle out. I got under the table and raised the blanket and went to work to saw a section of the big bottom log out, big enough to let me through. Well, it was a good long job, but I was getting toward the end of it when I heard Pap's gun in the woods. I got rid of the signs of my work and dropped the blanket and hid my saw, and pretty soon, Pap come in. weren't in any good humor, so he was his natural self. He said he was down to town and everything was going wrong. His lawyer said he reckoned he would win his lawsuit and get my money, if they ever got started on the trial. But then there was ways to put it off a long time. He said people allowed there'd be another trial to get me away from him and to give me to the widow for my guardian. And the guester would win this time. Well, this shook me up considerable because... I didn't want to go back to the widows anymore and be so cramped up and civilized, as they called it. And then the old man got to cussing and cussed everything and everybody he could think of. And then it cussed him all over again to make sure he hadn't skipped any. And, and after that, he polished off with a kind of general cuss all around, including a considerable parcel of people which he didn't even know the names of. And so called them what's-his-name whenever he got to him and went right along with his cussing. The old man made me go to the skiff and fetch the things he'd got. There was a 50-pound sack of cornmeal and a side of bacon 
ammunition, and a four-gallon jug of whiskey, and, and an old book, and two newspapers for Wadden, uh, besides some tow. Well, I towed it up a load, and went back and sat down on the bow of the skiff to rest. I thought it all over, and I reckoned I would walk off with a gun and some lines and take to the woods when I ran away. I guessed I wouldn't stay in one place, but just tramp right across the country, mostly night times, and hunt and fish to keep alive, and so get so far away that the old man or the widow couldn't ever find me anymore. I judged I would saw out and leave that night, if Pap got drunk enough, and I reckoned he would. I got so full of it, I didn't notice how long I was staying, till the old man hollered and asked me whether I was asleep or drowned. So I got the things all up to the cabin, and then it was about dark. While I was cooking supper, the old man took a swig or two and got sort of warmed up and went to ripping again. He'd been drunk over in town and laid in the gutter all night, and <laughs> he was a sight to look at. A body would have thought he was Adam. He was just all mud. Whenever his liquor begun to work, he almost always went for the government. And this time it says, Call this a government? Why, well, just look at it and see what it's like. Here's the law standing ready to take a man's son away from him. A man's own son, which had had all the trouble and all the anxiety and all the expense of raising. Yeah, and just as that man has got that son raised at last and ready to go to work and begin to do something for him and give him a rest, the law up and goes for him. Yeah, and they call that government. Papa was going on so, he never noticed where his old limber legs was taking him to, so he went head over heels over the tub of salt pork and barked both shins, and the rest of his speech was all the hottest kind of language. He hopped around the cabin considerable, first on one leg and then on another, holding first one shin and then the other one, and at last it let out with his left foot all of a sudden and fetched the tub a rattling kick. Yeah, but it weren't good judgment, because that was the boot that had a couple of his toes leaking out the front end of it. So now he raised a howl that fairly made a body's hair raise, and down he went in the dirt and rolled there and held his toes, and the cussing he'd done then laid over anything he'd ever done previous. And he said so his own self afterwards. He'd heard old Sowberry Hagen in his best days, and he said it laid over him, too. But I, I reckon that was sort of piling it on, maybe. After supper, Pap took the jug, said he had enough whiskey there for two drunks and one delirium tremens. <laughs> that was always his word. I judged he would be blind drunk in about an hour, and then I would steal a key or saw myself out, one or t'other. Well, he drank and drank and tumbled down on his blankets by and by, but luck didn't run my way. He didn't go sound asleep, but was uneasy. He groaned and moaned and thrashed around this way and that for a long time. At last I got so sleepy, I, I couldn't keep my eyes open, all I could do. And so before I knowed what I was about, I was sound asleep and the candle burning. I didn't know how long I was asleep, but all of a sudden there was an awful scream and I was up. And there was Pap, looking wild and skipping around every which way and yelling about snakes. He, he said there was crawling up his legs and and then he would give a jump and scream and, and say one had bit him on the cheek. But I couldn't see no snakes. He started and run round and round the cabin hollering, Take him off! Take him off! He's biting me on the neck! I never see a man look so wild in the eyes. Well, pretty soon he was all fagged out and fell down panting. And then he rolled over and over, wonderful fast, kicking things every which way and striking and grabbing at the air with his hands and screaming and, and said there was devils a hold of him. Well, he wore out by and by and laid still a while, moaning. Then he laid stiller and didn't make a sound. I could hear the owls and the wolves way off in the woods, and it seemed terrible still. By and by, he rolled out and jumped on his feet, looking wild, and he see me and he went for me. He chased me round and round the place with a clasp knife, calling me the angel of death and saying he would kill me, and then I couldn't come for him no more. I begged, and I told him I was only Huck, but he laughed such a screechy laugh and roared and cussed and kept on chasing me up. Once, when I turned short and dodged under his arm, he made a grab and got me by the jacket between my shoulders, and I thought I was gone. 
but I slid out of the jacket quick as lightning and saved myself. Pretty soon, he was all tired out and dropped down on his back against the door and said he would rest a minute and then kill me. He put his knife under him and said he would sleep and get strong and then he would see who was who. And so he dozed off pretty soon. By and by, I got the old split-bottom chair and clumb up as easy as I could not to make any noise and got down the gun. I slipped the ramrod down it to make sure it was loaded and then I laid it across the turnip barrel, pointing towards Pap, and sat down behind it to wait for him to stir. And how slow and still the time did drag along. Get up. What you about? I opened my eyes and looked round, trying to make out where I was. It was after sunup, and I'd been sound asleep. Pap was standing over me, looking sour and sick, too. He says, What you doing with this gun? I judged he didn't know nothing about what he'd been doing, so I says, Somebody tried to get in, so I was laying for him. Why didn't you rouse me out? Well, I, I tried to, but I couldn't. I, I, I couldn't budge you. Well, all right. I don't stand there plavering all day, but be out with you and see if there's fish on the lines for breakfast. I'll be along in a minute. He unlocked the door, and I cleared out up the bank. I noticed some pieces of limbs and such things floating down and a sprinkling of bark, so I knowed the river had begun to rise. I reckon I would have great times now if I was over at the town. The June rise used to be always luck for me, because as soon as that rise begins, here comes cordwood floating down and pieces of log rafts, sometimes a dozen logs together. So all you have to do is catch them and sell them to the wood yards and the sawmill. I went along up the bank with one eye out for Pap and the other out for what the rise might fetch along. Well, all at once, here comes a canoe, just a beauty, too about 13 or 14 foot long, riding high like a duck. I shot head first off the bank like a frog, clothes and all on, and struck out for the canoe. I just expected there'd be somebody laying down in it, because people often done that to fool folks, and when a chap had pulled a skiff out, most to it they'd raise up and laugh at him. Huh, but it weren't so this time. It was a drift canoe, sure enough, and I clumb in and paddles her ashore. Thinks I. Why, oh, the old man will be glad when he sees this. She's worth ten dollars. But when I got to shore, Pap wasn't in sight yet. And as I was running her into the little creek like a gully, all hung over with vines and willows, I struck another idea. I judged I'd hide her good, and then, instead of taking her to the woods when I'd run off, I'd go down the river about fifty mile and camp in one place for good, and not have such a rough time tramping on foot. It was pretty close to the shanty, and I thought I heard the old man coming all the time, but I got her hid, and then I out and looked around a bunch of willows, and there was the old man down the path a piece, just drawing a bead on a bird with his gun, so he hadn't seen anything. When he got along, I was hard at it, taking up a trot line. He abused me a little for being so slow, but I told him I fell in the river, and that's what made me so long. I knowed he would see I was wet, and then he'd be asking questions. We got five catfish off of the lines and went home. While we laid off after breakfast to sleep up, both of us being about wore out, I got to thinking that if I could fix up some way to keep Pap and the widow from trying to follow me, it would be a certainer thing than trusting to luck to get far enough off before they miss me. You see, all kinds of things might happen. Well, I didn't see no way for a while by and by, Pap raised up a minute to drink another barrel of water, and he says, Another time a man come prowling around here, you rouse me out, you hear? That man warn't here for no good. I'd have shot him. Next time, you rouse me out, you hear? And then he dropped down and went to sleep again. But what he'd been saying, give me the very idea I wanted. I says to myself, I can fix it now so nobody won't think of following me.
About 12 o'clock, we turned out and went along up the bank. The river was coming up pretty fast and lots of driftwood going by on the rise. By and by, along comes part of a log raft. Nine logs passed together. We went out with a skiff and towed it ashore. Then we had dinner. Anybody but Pap would have waited and seen the day through so as to catch more stuff, but that weren't Pap's style. Nine logs was enough for any one time. He must shove right over to town and sell. So he locked me in and took the skiff and started off towing the raft about half past three. I judged he wouldn't come back that night. I waited till I reckoned he'd got a good start, and then I out with my saw and went to work on that log again. Before he was to the other side of the river, I was out of the hole. Him and his raft was just a speck on the water way off yonder. I took the sack of corn meal and took it to where the canoe was hid and shoved the vines and branches apart and put it in, and then I'd done the same with a side of bacon and then the whiskey jug. I took all the coffee and sugar there was and all the ammunition. I took the wadden. I took the bucket and gourd. I took a dipper and a tin cup and my old saw and two blankets and the skillet and the coffee pot. I took fish lines and matches and, and other things, everything that was worth a cent. I cleaned out the place. I wanted an axe, but there wasn't any. Only, only the one at the wood pile. And I knowed why I was going to leave that. I fetched out the gun, and now I was done. It was all grass cleared the canoe, so I hadn't left a track. I followed around to see. I stood on the bank and looked out over the river. All safe. So I took the gun and ran up a piece into the woods and was hunting around for some birds when I see a wild pig. The hogs soon went wild in them bottoms after they'd got away from the prairie farms. Well, I shot this feller and took him into camp. I took the axe and smashed in the door. I beat it and hacked it considerable at doing it. I fetched the pig in and took him nearly to the table and hacked into his throat with the axe and laid him down on the ground to bleed. Now, I say ground because it was ground, hard packed and no boards. Well, next, I took an old sack and put a lot of big rocks in it, all I could drag, and I started it from the pig and dragged it to the door and through the woods down to the river and dumped it in and down it sunk out of sight. You could easily see that something had been dragged over the ground. I did wish Tom Sawyer was there. I knowed he would take an interest in this kind of business and throw in the fancy touches. Nobody could spread himself like Tom Sawyer and such a thing as that. Well, last... I pulled out some of my hair and blooded the axe good and stuck it on the back side and slung the axe in the corner. Then I took up the pig and held him to my breast with my jacket so he couldn't drip till I got a good piece below the house and then dumped him into the river. Well, now I thought of something else. So I went and got the bag of meal and my old saw out of the canoe and fetched him to the house. I took the bag to where it used to stand and ripped a hole in the bottom of it with a saw, for there weren't no knives and forks on the place. Pap done everything with his clasp knife about the cooking. Then I carried the sack about a hundred yards across the grass and through the willows east of the house to a shallow lake that was about five miles wide and full of rushes, and ducks, too, you might say, in the season. There was a slough or a creek leading out of it on the other side that went miles away. I don't know where, but it didn't go to the river. The meal sifted out of the sack and made a little track all the way to the lake. I dropped Pap's whetstone there, too, so as to look as if it had been done by accident. Then I tied up the rip in the meal sack with a string so it wouldn't leak no more and took it and my saw to the canoe again. Well, it's about dark now, so I dropped the canoe down the river under some willows that hung over the bank and waited for the moon to rise. I made fast to a willow, and then I took a bite to eat. And by and by, laid down in the canoe to smoke a pipe and lay out a plan. I says to myself, they'll follow the track of that sack full of rocks to the shore and then drag the river for me. And they'll follow that meal track to the lake and go browsing down the creek that leads out of it to find the robbers that killed me and took the things. 
They won't ever hunt the river for anything but my dead carcass. And they'll soon get tired of that and won't bother no more about me. All right? I can stop anywhere I want to. Jackson's Island's good enough for me. I know that island pretty well, and nobody ever comes there. And then I can paddle over to town nights and slink around and pick up things I want. Jackson's Island's the place. I was pretty tired, and the first thing I knowed, I was asleep. When I woke up, I didn't know where I was for a minute. I sat up and looked around, a little scared. And then I remembered. The river looked miles and miles across. The moon was so bright I could have counted the drift logs that went a-slipping along, black and still, hundreds of yards out from shore. Everything was dead quiet. And it looked late and smelled late. You know what I mean? I, I don't know the words to put it in. I took a good gap and a stretch and was just going to unhitch and start when I heard a sound way over the water. I listened. Pretty soon I made it out. It was that dull kind of regular sound that comes from oars working in rowlocks when it's a still night. I peeped out through the willow branches and there it was. A skiff way across the water. I couldn't tell how many was in it. It kept a coming, and when it was abreast of me, I see there weren't but one man in it. Thinks I, maybe it's Pap, though I weren't expecting him. He dropped below me with a current, and by and by he come a-swinging up shore in the easy water, and he went by so close I could have reached out the gun and touched him. Well, it was Pap, sure enough, and sober, too by the way he laid to his oars. I didn't lose no time. The next minute I was a-spinning downstream, soft but quick in the shade of the bank. I made two mile and a half, and then struck out a quarter of a mile or more toward the middle of the river, because pretty soon I would be passing the ferry landing, and people might see me and hail me. I got out amongst the driftwood, and then laid down in the bottom of the canoe and let her float. I laid there and had a good rest, and a smoke out of my pipe, looking away into the sky. Not a cloud in it. The sky looks ever so deep when you lay down on your back in the moonshine. I never knowed it before. And how far a body can hear on the water such nights. I heard people talking at the ferry landing. I heard what they said, too, every word of it. One man said it was getting toward the long days and the short nights now. The other one said, this weren't one of the short ones, he reckoned. And then they laughed. And, and he said it over again. And they laughed again. And then they waked up another fella and told him and laughed. But he, he didn't laugh. He ripped out something brisk and said, let him alone. Well, after that, the talk got further and further away. And I couldn't make out the words anymore. But I could hear the mumble. And now and then, a laugh, too but it seemed a long ways off. I was away below the ferry now. I rose up, and there was Jackson's Island, about two mile and a half downstream, heavy timbered and standing up out of the middle of the river, big and dark and solid, like a steamboat without any lights. There weren't any signs of the bar at the head. It was all underwater now. But it didn't take me long to get there, I shot past the head at a ripping rate. The current was so swift. And then I got into the dead water and landed on the side toward the Illinois shore. I run the canoe into a deep dent in the bank that I knowed about. I had to part the willow branches to get in. And when I made fast, nobody could have seen the canoe from the outside. I went up and sat down on a log at the head of the island and looked out on the big river and the black driftwood and away over the town, three mile away, where there was three or four lights twinkling. A monstrous big lumber raft was about a mile upstream, and coming along down with a lantern in the middle of it. I watched it come creeping down, 
and when it was almost abreast of where I stood, I heard a man say, Stern oars there. Heave her head to starboard. I heard that just as plain as if the man was by my side. There was a little gray in the sky now, so I stepped into the woods and laid down for a nap before breakfast. The sun was up so high when I waked that I judged it was after eight o'clock. I laid there in the grass and the cool shade, thinking about things and feeling rested and rather comfortable and satisfied. I could see the sun out at one or two holes, but mostly there was big trees all about and gloomy in there amongst them. There was freckled places on the ground where the light sifted down through the leaves and the freckled places swapped about a little, showing there was a little breeze up there. A couple of squirrels sat up on a limb and jabbered at me, very friendly. I was powerful lazy and comfortable. Didn't want to get up and cook breakfast. When I was dozing off again, when I think I hears a deep sound of boom, way up the river, arouses up and rests on my elbow and listens. Pretty soon, I hears it again. I hopped up and went and looked out at a hole in the leaves, and I see a bunch of smoke laying on the water a long ways up, about abreast of the ferry. And there was the ferry boat full of people floating along down. I knowed what the matter was now. Boom! I see the white smoke squirt out of the ferry boat's side. You see, there was fire and cannon over the water trying to make my carcass come up to the top. I was pretty hungry, but it weren't going to do for me to start a fire because they might see the smoke. So I sat there and watched the cannon smoke and listened to the boom. The river was a mile wide there, and it always looked pretty on a summer morning, so I was having a good enough time seeing them hunt for my remains. Why, if only I had a bite to eat. Well, then I happened to think how they always put quicksilver in loaves of bread and float them off because they always go right to the drowned carcass and stop there. So says I, I'll keep a lookout, and if any of them's floating around after me, I'll give them a show. Well, I changed to the Illinois edge of the island to see what luck I could have, and well, I weren't disappointed. A big double loaf come along, and I most got it with a long stick, but my foot slipped and she floated out further. Of course, I was where the current set in closest to the shore. I knowed enough for that. But by and by, along comes another one, and this time I won. I took out the plug and shook out the little dab of quicksilver and set my teeth in. It was baker's bread, or what the quality eat. None of your low-down corn pone. I got a good place amongst the leaves and sat there on a log, munching the bread and watching the ferry boat and very well satisfied. I lit a pipe and had a good long smoke and went on watching. The ferry boat was floating with the current, and I'd allowed I'd have a chance to see who was aboard when she come along, because she would soon come in close where the bread did. When she got pretty well along down towards me, I put out my pipe and went to where I fished out the bread and laid down behind a log on the bank in a little open place, where the log forked. I could peek through. By and by, she come along, and she drifted in so close that they could have run a plank out and walked the shore. Most everybody was on the boat. Pap, and Judge Thatcher, and, and Bessie Thatcher, and Joe Harper, and, and Tom Sawyer, and, and his old Aunt Polly, and Sid, and Mary, and, and plenty more. Everybody was talking about the murder. But the captain broke in and says, Look sharp now. The current sets in closest here and maybe he's washed ashore and got tangled up amongst the brush at the water's edge. I hope so, anyway. Well, I didn't hope so. They all crowded up and leaned over the rails, nearly in my face, and kept still, watching with all their might. I could see them first rate, but they couldn't see me. And then the captain sung out, Stand away! 
and the cannon let off such a blast right before me that it made me deaf with the noise and pretty near blind with the smoke, and I judged I was gone. If they'd have had some bullets in, I'd have reckoned they'd have got the corpse they was after. Well, I, I see I weren't hurt, thanks to goodness. The boat floated on and went out of sight around the shoulder of the island. I could hear the boom now and then, further and further off. And by and by, after an hour, I didn't hear it no more. The island was three mile long. I judged they got to the foot and was giving it up. Uh, but they didn't yet a while. They turned around the foot of the island and started up the channel on the Missouri side under steam and booming once in a while as they went. I crossed over to that side and watched them. When they got abreast the head of the island, they quit shooting and dropped over to the Missouri shore and went home to the town. I knowed I was all right now. Nobody else would come a-hunting after me. I got my traps out of the canoe and made me a nice camp in the thick woods. And so, for three days and nights, no difference, just the same thing. But the next day, I went exploring around down through the island. I was boss of it. It all belonged to me, so to say, and I wanted to know all about it. But mainly, I wanted to put in the time. Well, I went fooling along in the deep woods till I judged I weren't far from the foot of the island. I had my gun along, but I hadn't shot nothing. It was for protection. Thought I would kill some game nigh home. About this time, I mighty near stepped on a good-sized snake, and it went sliding off through the grass and flowers, and I after it, trying to get a shot at it. I clipped along, and all of a sudden, I bounded right onto the ashes of a campfire that was still smoking. My heart jumped up amongst my lungs. I never waited for it to look further, but uncocked my gun, and went sneaking back on my tiptoes as fast as ever I could. Every now and then, I stopped a second amongst the thick leaves and listened. But my breath come so hard I couldn't hear nothing else. I slunk along another piece further, then listened again, and so on, and so on. If I see a stump, I took it for a man. If I trod on a stick and broke it, it made me feel like a person had cut one of my breaths in two and I only got half in the short half, too. When I got to camp, I weren't feeling very brash. There weren't much sand in my craw. But I says, this ain't no time to be fooling around. So I got all my traps into my canoe again so as to have them out of sight, and I put out the fire and scattered the ashes round to look like an old last year's camp. I didn't sleep much. I couldn't, somehow, for thinking. And every time I waked up, I thought somebody had me by the neck. So the sleep didn't do me much good. By and by, I says to myself, I can't live this way. I'm a gonna find out who it is that's here on the island with me. I'll find it out or bust. Well, I felt better right off. So I took my paddle and slid out from shore just a step or two and then let the canoe drop along and down amongst the shadows. The moon was shining, and outside of the shadows, it made it almost light as day. I poked along well on to an hour, everything still as rocks and sound asleep. For by this time, I was most down to the foot of the island. A little ripply, cool breeze begun to blow, and that's as good as saying that night was about done. I give her a turn with a paddle and brung her nose to shore. Then I got my gun and slipped out and into the edge of the wood. I sat down there on a log and looked out through the leaves. I see the moon go off watch and the darkness begin to blanket the river. But in a little while, I see a pale streak over the treetops and no day was coming. So I took my gun and slipped off 
towards where I'd run across that campfire, stopping every minute or two to listen. But I hadn't no luck somehow. I couldn't seem to find the place. But by and by, sure enough, I catched a glimpse of fire way through the trees. I went for it, cautious and slow. By and by, I was close enough to have a look, and there laid a man on the ground. It most gave me the fan tods. He had a blanket round his head, and his head was nearly in the fire. I sat there behind a clump of bushes in about six foot of them and kept my eyes on him steady. It was getting gray daylight now. Pretty soon, he gaped and stretched himself and hove off the blanket, and it was Miss Watson's Jim. I bet I was glad to see him. I says, hello, Jim, and skipped out. He bounced up and stared at me wild. Then he drops down on his knees and puts his hand together and says, Don't hurt me. Don't. I ain't ever done no harm to a ghost. I always liked dead people and done them all the good I could for them. Now, you go and get in that river again where you belong and don't do nothing to old Jim as always your friend. Well, I weren't long making him understand I weren't dead. I was ever so glad to see Jim. I weren't lonesome now. I told him I weren't afraid of him telling the people where I was. I talked along, but he only sat there and looked at me. Never said nothing. And then I says, hey, It's good daylight. Let's get breakfast. Make up your campfire good. What's the use of making up the campfire to cook strawberries and such, truck? But you got a gun, ain't you? and we can get something better than them strawberries. Strawberries and such, Chuck, I says. Is that what you live on? I couldn't get nothing else, he says. Why, how long you been on the island, Jim? I come here the night after you's killed. Why, all that time? Yes, indeedy. Hey, you ain't had nothing but that kind of rubbish to eat? No, sir, nothing else. Why, well, you must be most starved, ain't you? I reckon I could eat a horse. Yeah, I think I could. How long you been on the island? Since the night I got killed? No. Wow, what does you live on? But you got a gun? Oh, yeah, you got a gun. That's good. Now, you kill something, and I'll make up the fire. So I went over to where the canoe was, and while I built a fire in a grassy open place amongst the trees, I fetched meal and bacon and coffee and coffee pot and frying pan and, and sugar and tin cups. It was set back considerable, because he reckoned it was all done with witchcraft. I catched a good big catfish, too, and Jim cleaned him with his knife and fried him. When breakfast was ready, we lolled on the grass and ate it smoking hot. Jim laid in it with all his might, for he was most about starved. And then when we got pretty well stuffed, we laid off and lazied. By and by, Jim says, But well, looky here, Huck. Who was it that was killed in that shanty if it weren't you? Then I told him the whole thing, and he said it was smart. He said, Tom Sawyer couldn't get up no better plan than when I had. And then I says, how do you come to be here, Jim, and, and how'd you get here? He looked pretty uneasy, and he didn't say nothing for a minute. And then he says, Babe, I better not tell. Why, Jim? Well, there's reasons. But you wouldn't tell on me if I was to tell you, would you, Huck? Blamed if I would, Jim. Well, I believe you, Huck. I, I run off. Jim! But mind you, you said you wouldn't tell. You know you said you wouldn't tell, Huck. Well, I did. I said I wouldn't, and I'll stick to it. Honest engine, I will. People will call me a low-down abolitionist and despise me for keeping mum. But that don't make no difference. I ain't a-gonna tell, and I ain't a-going back there anyways. So now, let's know all about it. Well, you see, it is this way. Old missus, that's Miss Watson... She pecks on me all the time and treats me pretty rough, but she always said she wouldn't sell me down to Orleans. But I noticed 
There was a trade around the place considerable lately, and I began to get uneasy. Well, one night, I creeps to the door pretty late, and the door weren't quite shut, and I hear old missus tell the widow she wouldn't sell me down to Orleans, but she didn't want to, but she could get $800 for me. And it is such a big stack of money she couldn't resist. But the widow, she tried to get her to say she wouldn't do it. But I never waited to hear the rest. I lit out mighty quick, I tell you. Huckleberry Finn and Jim, the runaway Negro slave, build themselves a raft and set off to float down the Mississippi, traveling at night and hiding by the river bank during the day, because if Jim is caught, he's sure to be punished and sold into slavery again. They have a marvelous time and many exciting adventures and narrow escapes. But after several months, when they're deep into the southern states, Jim is captured. Huck discovers that his friend is being kept locked up on a small cotton plantation run by a man called Silas Phelps. He decides to go to the rescue. I went right along, not fixing up any particular plan, but just trusting to Providence to put the right words in my mouth when the time come. For I'd noticed that Providence always did put the right words in my mouth, if I left it alone. When I got halfway, First one hound, and then another one got up and went for me. And of course I stopped and faced them and kept still. And such another powwow as they made. In a quarter of a minute, I was a kind of hub of a wheel, as you might say. Spokes made out of dogs. Circle of fifteen of them packed together around me, with their necks and noses stretched up towards me, a barking and a howling, and, and more a coming. You could see them sailing over fences and around corners from everywhere. A woman come tearing out of the kitchen with a rolling pin in her hand, singing out, Be gone, you tag, you spot, be gone, sir. And she fetched first one, and then another of them a clip, and sent them howling, and then the rest followed. In the next second, Half of them come back, wagging their tails around me and making friends with me. Ah, there ain't no harm in a hound no how. And behind the woman comes a little n girl and two little n boys without anything on but toe linen shirts. And they hung on to their mother's gown and peeped out from behind her at me, bashful, the way they always do. And here comes the white woman running from the house, uh, about 45 or 50 year old, bareheaded, and her spinning stick in her hand. And behind her comes her little white children acting the same way the little nurse was doing. She was smiling all over so she could hardly stand and says, It's you at last, ain't it? I out with a yes -um before I thought. She grabbed me and hugged me tight and then gripped me by both hands and shook and shook and the tears come in her eyes and run down over, and she couldn't seem to hug and shake enough, and kept saying, You don't look as much like your mother as I reckoned you would, but, law's sake, I don't care for that. I'm so glad to see you. Dear, dear, it does seem like I could eat you up. Children, it's your cousin Tom. Tell him howdy. But they ducked their heads and put their fingers in their mouths and hid behind her, so she run on. Liza, hurry up and get him a hot breakfast right away. Or uh, did you get your breakfast on the boat? I said I got it on the boat. 
So then she started for the house, leading me by the hand, and the children tagging after. When we got there, she set me down in a split-bottom chair and set herself down on a little low stool in front of me, holding both of my hands, and says, Now, I can have a good look at you. And laws of me, I've been hungry for it for many and many a time all these long years, and it's come at last. We've been expecting you a couple of days or more. What's kept you? Boat get aground? Your uncle's been up to town every day to fetch you, and he's gone again, not more than an hour ago. He'll be back in a minute now. You must have met him on the road, didn't you? Oldish man with a... No, I, uh, I didn't see anybody. Uh, the, the boat landed just at daylight, and I, I left my baggage on the wharf boat and, and uh, went looking around the town and out a piece in the country to put in the time and, uh, and not get here too soon. Uh, so I came down the back way. Well, who'd you give the baggage to? Nobody. What child, it'll be stole. Not where I hid it, I reckon it won't, I says. Well, how'd you get your breakfast so early on the boat? It was kind of thin ice, but I says, well, the captain seen me standing round and told me I better have something to eat before I went ashore. So he took me in the Texas to the officer's lunch and gave me all I wanted. I was getting so uneasy, I couldn't listen good. I had my mind on the children all the time. I wanted to get them out to one side and pump them a little and find out who I was supposed to be. But I couldn't get no show. Mrs. Phelps kept it up and run on so. Pretty soon, she made the cold chills streak all down my back because she says, But here we are a running on this way, and you ain't told me a word about sis nor any of them. Now I'll rest my works a little, and you start up yearn, and just tell me everything. Tell me all about them all, every one of them how they are, and what they're doing, and, and what they told you to tell me, and every last thing you can think of. Well, I see I was up a stump, and up it good. Providence had stood by me this for all right, but I was hard and tight a ground now. I see it weren't going to be a bit of use to try to go ahead. I'd got to throw up my hand. I opened my mouth to begin, but she grabbed me and hustled me in behind the bed and says, Here it comes. Now, stick your head down lower. There, that'll do it. You can't be seen now. And don't let on your hair. I'll play a joke on him. Children, don't you say a word. See, I was in a fix now, but it weren't no use to worry. There weren't nothing to do but just hold still and try to be ready to stand from under when the lightning struck. I had just one little glimpse of the old gentleman when he come in, and then the bed hit him. Mrs. Phelps, she jumps for him and says, Has he come? No, says her husband. Goodness gracious, she says. What in the world could have become of him? I can't imagine, says the old gentleman. And I must say, it makes me dreadful uneasy. Uneasy, she says. I'm ready to go distracted. He must have come, and you missed him along the road. I know it's so. Something tells me so. Why, Sally, I couldn't have missed him along the road. You know that. Why, Silas, look yonder, up the road. Ain't that somebody coming? He sprung to the window at the head of the bed, and that gave Mrs. Phelps the chance she wanted. She stooped down quick at the foot of the bed, and give me a pull, and out I come. And when he turned back from the window, there she stood, a-beaming and a-smiling like a house afire. And I was standing pretty meek and sweaty alongside. The old gentleman stared and says, Why, well, who's that? Well, who do you reckon it is? I ain't no idea. Who is it? It's Tom Sawyer. By jings, I most slumped through the floor. But there weren't no time to swap knives. The old man grabbed me by the hand and shook, 
and kept on shaking and all the time, and how the woman did dance around and laugh and cry, and then how they both did fire off questions about Sid and Mary and the rest of the tribe. But if they was joyful, it weren't nothing to what I was, for it was like being born again. I was so glad to find out who I was. Well, they froze to me for two hours, and at last, when my chin was so tired it couldn't hardly go no more, I told them more about my family, I mean the Sawyer family, than ever happened to any six Sawyer families. I was feeling pretty comfortable all down one side and pretty uncomfortable all up the other. Being Tom Sawyer was easy and comfortable, and it stayed easy and comfortable till by and by. I hear a steamboat coughing along down the river, and then I says to myself, suppose Tom Sawyer come down on that boat, and suppose it steps in here any minute and sings out my name before I can throw him a wink to keep quiet. Well, I couldn't have it that way. It wouldn't do at all. I must go up the road and way lay him. So I told the folks I reckoned I'd have to go up to town and fetch down my baggage. Well, the old gentleman, he was for going along with me. But I said, no, I, I could drive the horse myself, and I'd rather it wouldn't take no trouble about me. So I started for town in the wagon, and when I was halfway, I see a wagon coming along, and sure enough, it was Tom Sawyer. And I stopped and waited till it come along. I says, hold on. And it stopped alongside, and his mouth opened like a trunk and stayed so and is swallowed two or three times like a person that's got a dry throat, and then says, I, I, I ain't never done you no harm. You know that. So then, what do you want to come back and haunt me for? And I says, I ain't come back. I ain't been gone. When he heard my voice, it righted him some, but it weren't quite satisfied yet. He says, now, don't, don't you play nothing on me, because... Because I wouldn't on you. Honest engine now. You ain't a ghost. Honest engine, I ain't, I says. Well, I... I... Well, that ought to settle it, of course. But I can't somehow seem to understand it, no way. Looky here. Weren't you ever murdered at all? No, I weren't ever murdered at all. I played it on him. Look, you come in here and feel of me if you don't believe me. And so he done it, and it satisfied him. And he was that glad to see me again, he didn't know what to do. And he wanted to know all about it right off, because it was a grand adventure and mysterious, and so it hit him where it lived. But I said, leave it alone till by and by, and told his driver to wait, and we drove off a little piece, and I told him the kind of fix I was in, and what did he reckon we'd better do. And he said, let him alone a minute and don't disturb him. So he thought and thought, and pretty soon he says, It's all right, I got it. Take my trunk in your wagon and let on its yearn. A and you turn back and fool along slow so as to get to the house about the time you ought to. And I'll go towards town a piece and take a fresh start and get there a quarter or half an hour after you. And you needn't let on you know me at first. I says, all right, oh, but, but wait a minute, there's one more thing, a thing that nobody don't know but me, and that is, there's a nigger here that I'm a-trying to steal out of slavery, and his name is Jim, old Miss Watson's Jim. And he says, what? Why, Jim is... He stopped and went to study. I says, I know what you'll say. You'll say it's dirty, low-down business, but, but what if it is? I'm low-down, and I'm going to steal them, and I want you to keep mum and not let on. Will you? His eyes lit up, and he says, I'll help you steal them. Well, I let go all holts then like I was shot. It was the most astonishing speech I ever heard, and I'm bound to say Tom Sawyer fell considerable in my estimation. Only I couldn't believe it. Tom Sawyer, the stealer. Ah, shucks, I says. You're joking. I ain't joking either. 
Well, Anna says, joking or no joking, if you hear anything said about a runaway, don't forget to remember that you don't know nothing about him, and I don't know nothing about him. So the boys return to the Phelps plantation, where Huck still pretends to be Tom Sawyer, and Tom pretends to be his own younger brother, Sid. They find out where Jim, the Negro slave, is being held prisoner, in a cabin which has a lean-to shed next to it. They let Jim know that rescue is on the way, then begin to make their plans. But Tom is highly dissatisfied. Blame it! This whole thing is just as easy and awkward as it can be. And it makes it so rotten difficult to get up a difficult plan. There ain't no watchman to be drugged. Now, there ought to be a watchman. There ain't even a dog to give a sleeping mixture to. And there's Jim chained by one leg with a ten-foot chain to the leg of his bed. Why, all you got to do is lift up the bedstead and slip off the chain. And Uncle Silas, he trusts everybody. Sends the key to the pumpkin-headed and don't send nobody to watch the nigger. Jim could have got out that window hole before this. Only there wouldn't be no use to trying to travel with a ten-foot chain on his leg. My dratted Huck, it's the stupidest arrangement I ever see. You gotta invent all the difficulties. Well, we can't help it. We gotta do the best we can with the materials we got. Anyhow, there's, there's more honor in getting them through a lot of difficulties and dangers where there weren't none of them furnished to you by the people who it was their duty to furnish them. And you had to contrive them all out of your own head. Now, whilst I think of it, we gotta hunt up something to make a saw out of, the first chance we get. Well, what do we want of a saw? What do we want of it? Ain't we gotta saw the leg off of Jim's bed so as to get the chain loose? Why, you just said a body could lift up the bedstead and slip the chain off. Well, if that ain't just like you, Huck Finn, you can get up the infant schooliest ways of going at a thing. Why, ain't you ever read any books at all? Baron Trench, nor Casanova, nor, nor Benvenuti Cellini, nor Henry Four, nor, nor none of them heroes? Who ever heard of getting a prisoner loose in such an old matey way as that? Nah, the way the best authorities does it, is to saw the bed leg in two and leave it just so and swallow the sawdust so it can't be found and put some dirt and grease around the sawed places so the very keenest sensical can't see no sign of its being sawed and thinks the bed leg is perfectly sound. Then the night you're ready, fetch the leg a kick and down she goes. Slip off your chain and there you are. Nothing to do but hit your rope ladder to the battlements, shin down it, break your leg in the moat, because a rope ladder is always 19 feet too short, you know. And then there's your horses and your trusty vassals, and they scoop you up and fling you across a saddle, and away you go to your native Languedoc, or Navarre, or wherever it is. It's gaudy, Huck. Oh, I wish there was a moat to this cabin. If we get time, the night of the escape, we'll dig one. I says, what do we want of a moat when we're going to snake him out from under the cabin? But he never heard me. He'd forgot me and everything else. He had his chin in his hand, thinking. Pretty soon he sighs and shakes his head, then sighs again and says, No, nah, it wouldn't do. There ain't necessity enough for it. For what, I says. Why to saw Jim's leg off, he says. Good land, I says. Why, there ain't no necessity for it. What would you want to saw his leg off for anyway? Well, some of the best authorities has done it. They couldn't get the chain off, so they just cut their hand off and shoved, and a leg would be better still. But we got to let that go. There ain't necessity enough for it in this case, and besides, Jim's a and wouldn't understand the reasons for it and, and how it's the custom in Europe, so we'll let it go. But there's one thing. He can have a rope ladder. We can tear up our sheets and make him a rope ladder easy enough. We can send it to him in a pie. It's mostly done that way. And I've had worse pies. But 
Tom Sawyer, how you talk, I says. Jim ain't got no use for a rope ladder. He has got use for it. How you talk. You better say you don't know nothing about it. He's got to have a rope ladder. They all do. We waited that morning till everybody was settled down to business and nobody in sight around the yard. Then Tom, he carried the sack into the lean-to whilst I stood off a piece to keep watch. By and by he comes out and we went and sat down on the woodpile to talk. He says, everything's all right now except tools and that's easy fixed. Tools, I says, yeah. Tools for what? Why to dig with? We ain't a gonna gnaw him out, are we? Well, ain't them old crippled picks and things in there good enough to dig an ear out with, I says. He turns on me, looking pitying enough to make a body cry, and says, Huck Finn, did you ever hear of a prisoner having picks and shovels and, and all the modern conveniences in his wardrobe to dig himself out with? And I want to ask you, if you got any reasonableness in you at all, what kind of show would that give him to be a hero? Why, they might as well lend him the key and done with it. Picks and shovels. Why, they wouldn't furnish him to a king. Well, then, I says, if we don't want picks and shovels, what do we want? A couple of case knives. To dig the foundations out from under that cabin with? Yeah. Confound it, it's foolish, Tom. It don't make no difference how foolish it is. It's the right way, and it's the regular way. And there ain't no other way that ever I heard of. And I've read all the books that gives any information about these things. They always dig out with a case knife. And not through dirt, mind you. Generally, it's through solid rock. And it takes them weeks and weeks and weeks. And, and forever and ever. What? Look at one of them prisoners in the bottom dungeon of the Castle Deep in the harbor of Marseilles that dug himself out that way. How long was he at it, you reckon? Well, I don't know. Well, guess. <laughs> I don't know. A month and a half? Thirty-seven year. And he come out in China. That's the kind. I wish the bottom of this fortress was solid rock. Jim don't know nobody in China. What's that got to do with it? Neither did that other fella. But you're always a wandering off on a side issue. Why can't you stick to the main point? All right, all right, I, I don't care where it comes out. So he comes out. And Jim don't either, I reckon. Uh, but there's one thing anyway. Jim's too old to be dug out with a case knife. He won't last. Yes, he will last too. You don't reckon it's going to take 37 years to dig out through a dirt foundation, do you? Well, how long will it take, Tom? Well, we can't risk being as long as we ought to because it mayn't take very long for Uncle Silas to hear from down there by New Orleans. He'll hear Jim ain't from there, and then his next move will be to advertise Jim or something like that. So we can't risk being as long digging him out as we ought to. By rights, I reckon we ought to be a couple of years. Uh, but we can't. Things being so uncertain, what I recommend is this, that we really dig right in as quick as we can, and after that, we can let on to ourselves that we was at it 37 years. Then we can snatch them out and rush them away the first time there's an alarm. Yeah, I reckon that'll be the best way. That night, we went down the lightning rod a little after 10 and took one of the candles along and listened under the window hole and heard Jim snoring. So we pitched it in and it didn't wake him. Then we whirled in with a pick and shovel and in about two hours and a half, the job was done. We crept in under Jim's bed and into the cabin and pawed around and found the candle and lit it and stood over Jim a while and found him looking hearty and healthy and then we woke him up, gentle and gradual. 
he was so glad to see us, he most cried and called us honey and all the pet names he could think of and was for having us hunt up a cold chisel to cut the chain off his leg with right away and clearing out without losing any time. But Tom, he showed him how unregular it would be and sat down and told him all about our plans and how we could alter them in a minute any time there was an alarm and not to be the least afraid because we would see he got away sure. So Jim said it was all right and we sat there and talked over old times a while when then Tom asked a lot of questions. And when Jim told him Uncle Silas come in every day or two to pray with him, and Aunt Sally come in to see if he was comfortable and had plenty to eat, and both of them was kind as they could be, Tom says, now I know how to fix it. We'll send you some things by them. And I said, don't do nothing of the kind. It's, it's one of the most jackass ideas I ever struck. But he never paid no attention to me. He went right on. It was his way when he got his plan set. So he told Jim how we'd have to smuggle in a rope ladder pie and other large things by Nat that fed him. And he must be on the lookout and not be surprised and not let Nat see him open them. And we would put small things in Uncle's coat pockets and he must steal them out and we would tie things to Aunt's apron strings or put them in her apron pocket if we got a chance and told them what they would be and what they was for and told them how to keep a journal on his shirt with his blood and all that. He told them everything. Jim, <laughs> he couldn't see no sense in most of it, but he allowed we was white folks and knowed better than him, so he was satisfied and said we would do it all just as Tom said. Jim had plenty corn cob pipes and tobacco, so we had a right down good sociable time. And then we crawled out through the hole and so home to bed with hands looked like they'd been chawed. Tom was in high spirits. He said it was the best fun he ever had in his life and the most intellectual. He said if he could only see his way to it, we would keep it up all the rest of our lives and leave Jim to our children to get out. For he believed Jim would come to like it better and better the more he got used to it. He said that in that way, it could be strung out as much as 80 year, and it'd be the best time on record. And he said it would make us all celebrated that had a hand in it. three weeks, everything was in pretty good shape. The bed leg was sawed in two, and we had ate up the sawdust, and it give us the most amazing stomach ache. We reckoned we was all going to die, but didn't. It was the most undigestible sawdust I ever see, and Tom said the same. But as I was saying, we got all the work done now, at last, and we was all pretty much fagged out, too but mainly Jim. So Tom said, now for the anonymous letters. Well, what's them? I says. Warnings to the people that something is up. Sometimes it's done one way, sometimes another. But there's always somebody spying around that gives notice to the governor of the castle. When Louis the Sixteenth was going to light out from the Tuileries, a servant girl done it. It's a very good way, and so is the anonymous letters. We'll use them both. Oh, and it's usual for the prisoner's mother to change clothes with him. And she stays in, and he slides out in her clothes. We'll do that, too. Yeah, but, but looky here, Tom. What do we want to warn anybody for that something's up? Let them find it out for themselves. It's their lookout. Yeah, I know, but you can't depend on them. It's the way they've acted from the very start. Left us to do everything. They're so confiding and mullet-headed, they don't take notice of nothing at all. So if we don't give them notice, there won't be nobody nor nothing to interfere with us. And so, after all our hard work and trouble, this escape will go off perfectly flat. It won't amount to nothing. There won't be nothing to it. Well, as for me, Tom, that's the way I'd like. Shucks, he says, and looked disgusted. So I says, but I ain't gonna make no complaint. 
Anyway, what suits you suits me. What are you going to do about the servant girl? You'll be her. You slide in in the middle of the night and hook that yellow girl's frock. All right, then, I'll do it. But I could carry the anonymous letter just as handy in my own togs. You wouldn't look like a servant girl then, would you? No. But there won't be nobody to see what I look like anyway. That ain't got nothing to do with it. The thing for us to do is just do our duty and not worry about whether anybody sees us do it or not. Ain't you got no principle at all? All right, all right. I ain't saying nothing. I'm the servant girl. Who's Jim's mother? I'm his mother. I'll hook a gown from Aunt Sally. Well, then, you, you'll have to stay in the cabin when me and Jim leaves. Not much. I'll stuff Jim's clothes full of straw and lay it on his bed to represent his mother in disguise. And Jim will take the woman's gown off of me and wear it, and we'll all evade together. Uh, when a prisoner of style escapes, it's called an evasion. It's always so called when a king escapes, for instance, and the same with a king's son. And it don't make no difference whether he's a natural one or an unnatural one. So Tom, he wrote the anonymous letter, and I smooched the yellow wench's frock that night and put it on and shoved it under the front door the way Tom told me to. It said, Beware, trouble is a-brewing. Keep a sharp lookout. Unknown friend. Next night, we stuck a picture which Tom drawed in blood of a skull and crossbones on the front door and the next night, another one of a coffin on the back door. I never see a family in such a sweat. They couldn't have been worse scared if the place had been a full of ghosts laying for them behind everything and under the beds and shivering through the air. If a door banged, Aunt Sally, she jumped and said, Hooch! If anything fell, she jumped and said, Hooch! If you happened to touch her and she weren't noticing, she'd done the same thing. She couldn't face no way and be satisfied, because she allowed there was something behind her every time. So she was always a whirling around, sudden, and saying, Hoo! and before she'd get two-thirds around, she'd whirl back again and say it again. And she was afraid to go to bed, but she dasn't set up. So the thing was working very well. And Tom said, he said he never see a thing work more satisfactory. He said it showed it was done right. So he said, now for the grand bulge. So the next morning, at the streak of dawn, we got another letter ready and was wondering what we'd better do with it because we heard him say at supper they was going to have a neighbor on watch at both doors all night. Tom, he went down the lightning rod to spy around and the neighbor at the back door was asleep and he stuck it in the back of his neck and come back. This letter said, don't betray me. I wish to be your friend. There is a desperate gang of cutthroats from over in the Indian territory gonna steal your runaway tonight, and they have been trying to scare you so as you will stay in the house and not bother them. I am one of the gang, but have got religion and wish to quit it and lead an honest life again and will betray the hellish design. They will sneak along the fence at midnight exact with a false key and go in the next cabin to get him. I am to be off a piece and blow a tin horn if I see any danger. But instead of that, I will ba like a sheep soon as they get in and not blow at all. Then, whilst they are getting his chains loose, you slip in there and lock them in and can kill them at your leisure. Don't do anything but just the way I'm telling you. If you do, they will suspicion something and raise hoop jamboreo. I do not wish any reward but to know I have done the right thing. Unknown friend. Tom's letter gets results. The next night, Huck finds that the house is full of local men, gathered to fight off the invading gang. 
I was upstairs in a second, and down the lightning rod in another one, and shinning through the dark to the lean-to. I couldn't hardly get my words out, I was so anxious, but I told Tom as quick as I could, we must jump for it now and not a minute to lose. A house full of men yonder with guns. His eyes just blazed, and he says, No, is that so? Ain't it, boy? Why, Huck, if it was to do over again, I bet I could fetch 200. If we could put it off to... Hurry, hurry, I says. Where's Jim? Right at your elbow. If you reach out your arm, you can touch him. He's dressed and everything's ready. Now we'll slide out and give the sheep signal. But then we heard the tramp of men coming to the door and heard him begin to fumble with a padlock and heard a man say... I told you it would be too soon. They haven't come. The door is locked. Here, I'll lock some of you into the cabin, and you lay for them in the dark and kill them when they come. And the rest, scatter around a piece and listen if you can hear them coming. So, in they come. But they couldn't see us in the dark and almost trod on us while we was hustling to get under the bed. But we got under all right, and out through the hole, swift, but soft. Jim first, me next, and Tom last, which was according to Tom's orders. Now we was in the lean-to and heard trampings close by outside, so we crept to the door, and Tom stopped us there and put his eye to the crack, but couldn't make out nothing, it was so dark, and whispered and said he would listen for the steps to get further, and when he nudged us, Jim must glide out first, and him last. So he set his ear to the crack and listened, and listened, and listened, and the steps are scraping round out there all the time, and at last he nudged us and was slid out and stooped down, not breathing and not making the least noise, and slipped stealthy toward the fence in engine file and got to it all right, and me and Jim over it. But Tom's britches catched fast on a splinter on the top rail, and then he heard the steps coming, so he had to pull loose, which snapped the splinter and made a noise. And as he dropped in our tracks and started, somebody sings out, Who's that? Answer, or I'll shoot. But we didn't answer. We just unfurled our heels and shoved. Then there was a rush and a bang, 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 and the bullets fairly whizzed round us. We heard him sing out, Here they are. The broke for the river. After them, boys, and then let loose the dogs. So here they come, full tilt. We could hear them because they wore boots and yelled. But we didn't wear no boots and didn't yell. We was in the path to the mill, and when they got pretty close on us, we dodged into the bush and let them go by and dropped in behind them. They'd had all the dogs shut up so they wouldn't scare off the robbers. But by this time, Somebody had let them loose, and here they come, making powwow enough for a million. But they was our dogs, so we stopped in our tracks till they catched up. And when they see it weren't nobody but us, and no excitement to offer them, they only just said howdy and tore right ahead toward the shouting and clattering. And then we up steam again and whizzed along after them till we was nearly to the mill, and then struck up through the bush to where my canoe was tied and hopped in and pulled for dear life toward the middle of the river, but didn't make no more noise than we was obliged to. Then we struck out easy and comfortable for the island where my raft was, and we could hear them yelling and barking at each other all up and down the bank till we were so fur away the sounds got dim and died out. And when we stepped onto the raft, I says, Now, old Jim, you're a free man again and I bet you won't ever be a slave no more. And a mighty good job it was, too, Huck. It was plain beautiful, and it is done beautiful, and there ain't nobody can get up a plan that's more mixed up and splendid than that one was. We was all as glad as we could be, but Tom, he was the gladdest of all, because he had a bullet in the calf of his leg.
Jim, the Negro, insists that they get a doctor to treat Tom's wounded leg. So they do, and the escapers are found, and Jim and the boys are brought back to the plantation. But when Tom recovers, he makes an amazing announcement. Jim is a free man anyway. His former owner, old Miss Watson, had died two months earlier and had set him free in her will. The first time I catch Tom private, I asked him, what was his idea, the time of the evasion? What it was he'd planned to do if the evasion worked all right and managed to set a new free that was already free before? And he said what he'd planned in his head from the start. If we got Jim out all safe was for us to run him down river on the raft and have adventures plumb to the mouth of the river and then tell him about his being free and take him back up home on a steamboat in style and pay him for his lost time and write word ahead and get out all the news around and have him waltz him into town with a torchlight procession and a brass band. And then he would be a hero, and so would we. But I reckon it was about as well the way it was. We had Jim out of the chains in no time. And when Uncle Silas and Aunt Sally found out how good he helped the doctor nurse Tom, they made a heap of fuss over him and fixed him up prime and gave him all he wanted to eat and a good time and, and nothing to do. And we had him up to the sick room and had a high talk. And Tom gave Jim $40 for being prisoner for us so patient and doing it up so good. And Jim was pleased most to death. Tom's most well now and got his bullet round his neck on a watch guard for a watch and is always seeing what time it is. And so there ain't nothing more to write about and I'm rotten glad of it because if I'd have knowed what a trouble it was to make a book, I wouldn't have tackled it and ain't a gonna anymore. But I reckon I got a light out for the territory ahead of the rest because Aunt Sally, she's gonna adopt me and civilize me and I can't stand it. I've been there before. The end. Yours truly, Huck Finn.